joining us virtually from Vienna, Herr Ebner, I think. Graz. Oh, Graz, there you go. And um, um, Martin Ebner, um, I think, is known to, to many of you. He is currently the department, de departmental head of social learning as well as senior researcher at the Institute of Information Systems and Computer Media at Graz University of Technology. Um, he is an associate pro uh, professor in uh, media computer science, and his current research uh, focuses include e-learning, m-learning, social media, open educational resources, and learning analytics. We're delighted that you made it online, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, hello to everybody. Sorry that I'm not being attending here in Heidelberg, but uh, you know the situation of the railway in Germany. It's a little bit hard to, uh, due to the fact that uh, um, I would have to travel about 12 hours and uh, it was too risky for me to say, okay, I have to, I'm ending up in a railway station and I have to wait uh, uh, more than one hour or a couple of hours. Um, nevertheless, um, my talk will be about uh, our MOOCs, the chance to open up education. And um, I would like to address the idea why what we are doing with uh, open education resources together with uh, massive open online courses and why I see that this is a very important step. Um, first of all, I have just a, a slide for myself because uh, if I'm not physically there, uh, for sure you can uh, reach me virtually. Um, I'm blogging, I have Facebook accounts, Twitter, whatever. So if you have any questions afterwards uh, or the, the day afterwards or whatever, just contact me on any virtual uh, social media platform or write me an email, whatever. So I would like to answer it, of course. And um, first of all, I'd like to introduce what we are doing. Um, we have um, in Austria the only MOOC platform um, founded in, uh, in a couple, also nearly a year ago. It's called iMOOCs. And um, that is an project funded by uh, the land of Styria, uh, together with uh, the University of Graz and uh, the Graz University of Technology, which is my institution. And we provide an XMOOC platform. So um, I guess you know about the XMOOCs and the difference between the CMOOCs. And for courses, and our unique selling point is that we have explicit only courses online with uh, provide an open license. It means a Creative Commons license, CC BY, and um, that is our unique selling point uh, that we say we are exactly only doing OER and not selling courses, so we provide as open educational resources. Um, I will become uh, later on as a why this is a, a very important topic for us. Um, first of all, that is the platform. It um, currently holds um, eight courses. Uh, two courses are already over in the summer semester, and we are currently running six courses on different topics. We are running two MOOCs for schools. We are running uh, two MOOCs for a very broad public. And we are also running um, one course for a university lecture. And it's called iMOOCs. And that's the URL, iMOOCs.at, uh, where you can reach and where you can also register for free, uh, just providing an email address. And then you can access to any courses which are provided. For example, this was uh, the biggest course in the summer semester. It was about e-learning, um, more than 800 participants. And uh, it was also the first trial. Um, and the license was a CCPF by NC. And uh, there was uh, the topic e-learning. And uh, this is also a course which was run on the University of Graz. And you get in the background also ECTS on the university for that. Um, the next one is maybe also interesting because you see um, the broad uh, field we are addressing is um, a course on English, as an English language for chemical, uh, chemical students. Um, the students, um, we have a change currently at the Graz University of Technology that all our master students have to be in, uh, in 2018 in English. And um, that means that we are currently switching to the language of English. And of course, there are huge problems on the student side because they have a bachelor in German and now they have to do in English. And we are providing uh, for that a massive open online course where they can uh, just practice their vocabulary, uh, especially with a focus to uh, chemistry. 
Um, then we have uh, this course, maybe that is mo currently the most or the best known course um, of our platform. It's uh, called uh, Free Online Learning. And the idea was that we bring a course to a very, very broad public, uh, to a public um, which normally works not with the computer and normally works not with the internet. So that means, uh, for example, my mom or something like that. And we would like to show them through the course what they can do with the internet and how they can maybe also learn, search, learn and um, follow their interests. And the very interesting thing maybe with this uh, course is that we also provide an additional um, worksheet called in German Arbeitsheft. And this is in printout and people can order them for free um, from our institution, for example. And then this um, working sheet is uh, an add-on for the course. So that means they have a video, they have their self-assessments, they have additional links in the course, but also this additional working sheet where they have their task for the week. And this was done also in, co in a strong cooperation to the Volkshochschule. I, I guess you know, this is an adult uh, institution uh, who um, make the financial support for this um, working sheet. And they also provide um, uh, local learning groups. And uh, you can go there um, weekly and um, just discuss with the people how is this going on with the MOOC, what I was learning the last week. And therefore, they have, for example, the working sheet. We have sent out more than 3,500 working sheets in the German-speaking area. And uh, it's currently running with more than 850 participants, increasing, I guess, we will have in the end about 1,000 people who are attending currently this course. Yes, that is um, what we have done, or what we are doing uh, on the IMUX platform. And um, now I would like to give you a, a short introduction to open education resources that you exactly know what I'm understanding uh, with open education resources. Um, open education resources are part of the movement of open culture. Uh, maybe everyone is aware about open source. Also, open access is a very heavily discussed uh, point in the public. So it means there is something um, what is done by the public and is given for free to the public that they can enhance, change, and give it back to the public. So it means, for example, your browser Firefox uh, is such an open source program. You can use it for free. You can also change the code and you can provide it back uh, for the public if you have uh, changed something. And of course, the same idea um, is going to um, learning content, and that is called open education resources. That means you have uh, content um, provided by teachers, lecturers, that you can take it, uh, also for your own lecture, change it, and bring it back um, to the community. Uh, the idea was in 2002 from the UNESCO um, with the wish to develop together a universal education resource available for the whole of humanity. That was the original idea and of course the original idea was that we give our content on the West European or US uh, countries to the to countries who, who cannot uh, who haven't any learning content. You just think of Africa or something like that. But um, it's also very interesting for the German speaking uh, countries to provide OER. And I will come later on why it is why it is very important. Very important is the definition. An open education resource is usable for free, as so you can take it for free from the internet, of course. You can use it, you can reuse it, and you can also change it and as teacher. And then you just uh, provide it back to the public. And in a very uh, strict definition, you have also to use open standards. So, for example, you have to. Uh, use open office and not Word so that everyone is able to, uh, of course, change it. And, and that's very important, uh, you also provide a license, an, an according license. Here in our example, the Creative Commons license, where you say, what can be done with this resource? For example, in this case, you have to just um, take, as a, put your name, uh, my name uh, as author, on your new resource, and you have to provide it in the same way back. So that means it must be the same license in the end after you change. So the very, the very interesting thing is you have a free um, and open resource and you have also the right license theory because it's very important if you think of copyright issues that you know what you can exactly do with this uh, resource. Now you can ask why. Um, why is this very important? So why should we um, um, 
uh, have the idea of open education resources and it is really necessary for our educational systems. And uh, I have five crucial statements and I will like to explain it. I also show you some slides as so, uh, what is changing with um, this and why it is so important. The most important is the thesis one. Uh, OER is the answer to copyright issues and especially, and that's very, very important in German speaking countries. Uh, we have a very, very strict copyright um, law that didn't allow you anything to do. So that means if I make a working sheet, put it on online, then you're just allowed to see it. You're not allowed to download it. You use it because I have never defined it and I, it's my personal copyright issue. And uh, that means that any teacher who would like to use the slides of uh, Martin Ebner, for example, in the classroom is per se not allowed to do it um, if I have not um, added an appropriate license. And um, that is, um, of course, a big issue because if you think we are talking today about uh, digital classrooms, tablet classrooms, PC classrooms, whatever, then we have also to provide content which can be used so that children can, for example, um, write anything uh, on the uh, book what they have uh, get digitally and also send it back because, you, for example, you make any change to a document and you send it, for example, then you must be allowed to do so. And uh, in normal cases, usual cases, that is not allowed uh, because of the copyright issues. And it's especially in the middle European part um, where the copyright issues are very, very strong. You all know what that you uh, in Germany can, for example, watch uh, different YouTube videos not because um, Google uh, and the copyright issues does not allow it. And um, if you have, of course, um, open education resources where we just allow that, that this material can be used in any classroom, in any lecture hall, then um, it would be no problem anymore. And therefore, we have to engage teachers to, to make aware about it, what is the problem with copyright issues and when, what you have to do. And the solution in the long run might be as a, to say, just define your license to your content, make it open and free available. Then we can exchange and use it um, for education. Thesis two is um, OER enhances university teaching that um, give a totally new pers per perspective because uh, in the same way of the copyright issues. There is a, a great research study of 2007, also seven years ago, um, who said um, OER is um, helped to be much more flexible because you have a very huge con uh, content pool. So I cannot take only this book, I have a million of books and can uh, teach uh, with different content and can say um, also discussing about that and I have not just one resource. The reuse is of course um, very interesting for teachers because I have not to do it on my own. I can just take maybe the slides of my colleague and then add something that is a um, safe time of course in my uh, daily work. Um, the value will increase of the lecture content because if many, many people take the same content and uh, they will also uh, correct some mistakes or something like that. So we uh, think the quality will enhance and it supports also user centered usage and collaborative learning scenarios because um, children are now allowed to um, Support, uh, to work collaboratively. That is a very interesting thing because there are no copyright issues, so they can do it and they will do it, of course. Um, the next thing is um, OER, it they extend the target group, um, in especially if you think on the iMOOCs uh, platform. We, of course, have done a uh, first service in the summer semester. And uh, what's very interesting is if you see the, the first uh, chart, then you see the age of the participants, that 45 percent are students, yeah, that's um, quite usual, but uh, more than 50 percent of our participants in the MOOC courses are elder, uh, older than 35 years. And uh, this is a target group uh, which, for example, in my university we have never dealt before. So that means that they're not usual students that are uh, people who are already working outside who maybe um, doing something and they come back to the university and say, hey, there is a course that's very interesting for me. And um, it's also very interesting to uh, take a look um, what are, what the kind of people are that and you see that uh, the most 
big part of the people have already a, um, end up with a master student, uh, master um, degree. That means um, that there are very high qualified people who are attending the courses uh, because uh, that's uh, very interesting for them. And you see that more than 70% of them are employees. They have work. They are working in parallel, and uh, they uh, feel also very good as to use uh, this uh, MOOCs. Of course, also we have also uh, take a look uh, where are the people coming from. Um, you see that uh, in, the, uh, in the lower chart, of course, um, we have about 30% of our people are coming not from Austria. 70% are from Austria. Um, about 30% not from Austria, and about. Uh, 10% are more than in the world wide, and we have to uh, be reminded that we have only German speaking MOOCs. Yeah? So that we have no MOOC in English. That means um, our, our community is, of course, uh, very uh, related to the German speaking countries. Then, um, the uh, thesis four is um, open education resources increase the accessibility and also the visibility of all this content. And uh, this can be shown, for example, here. Um, I told you about this working sheet um, of the um, um, MOOC free online learning. And you see, for example, where all these local learning groups are located. And you see we have two groups in Hamburg, and we have, uh, of course, also groups in Graz. So we are really addressing a very, very broad audience um, that is much more that the university have ever done before, because of course we have much some students from Styria and uh, maybe some from Germany, but um, not in this uh, um, uh, amount. And um, then um, what is also interesting, um, the number of quizzes started, because uh, this was for me a, a very interesting thing to see how many people are going to the whole course, for example. And you see, um, the first one is four, more than 4,000. It's the first quiz, and uh, the eight quiz more than 500. That means uh, that are the people in between. There is a dropout. That is just a, a normal case in in such of such courses. But it's a very um, uh, since the sixth uh, quiz, we exactly know that about 500 people, um, about 20 percent of all the participants, will also end up the course. Yes, and the last one is uh, thesis five is uh, MOOCs also fosters learning competences. That it's um, a very interesting thing because we also ask the people in the final survey, um, what did you need to um, go through the MOOC? What, what, is, um, what is your feeling about? And you see the number one is uh, self-directed learning. So then the, exactly so that this, as you said us and gave us the feedback that self-directed learning for them was their competence they need most uh, in such a course that they get. And that's also very interesting because we need such people also in the public you know, to say we need people who are doing self-directed learning in the sense of lifelong learning. OK, then um, after that, I have also challenges, of course, um, that it's a big issue in a in university and in higher education. Um, if we are talking about massive open online courses, will they replace something or something like that? We have also done a publication, and uh, of course, we can talk hours of that. Um, but we clustered it into three or four perspectives. We addressed the lecturer, we addressed the institution, we have the students, and we have also the government issues. And all these issues you see, for example, the financial issue as well, also who is paying the sponsorship, for example, as well, um, how get the credits or something like from, from the student's perspective, we have to address in a university to uh, think if we can, in a long run, uh, provide also massive open online courses in our normal curricula. So this is a, a very huge uh, discussion. And it's not easy to say, OK, let us do that, because all these points uh, that we have listed here, for example, um, have to be be reminded. We have to discuss it and how can we solve it. And therefore, we did not expect that MOOCs, for example, will be a task of tomorrow we can really integrate in a typical uh, um, uh, um, curricula. Yes, um, and then also, uh, nevertheless, for me, it's uh, very, very interesting. I see a very huge potential um, of MOOCs as well as OER for the society, because once the quality improvement, we are going to a knowledge society, uh, Germany as well as Austria, this is the main part of our society is knowledge. 
then we have to provide access to education because we can educate people who have the chance to come to us. Um, we also provide them content. It's very important for lifelong learning and in the long run, it's really in the long run, it will also reduce our costs because we can reuse the learning material again and again. So I'd like to summarize my very short talk. It's our aims um, that um, with OER is that uh, educational content becomes accessible, usable, and changeable. That uh, we can do all with, and we have can lecture with this content. Um, it increases the visibility and the accessibility for e new target groups. And that's uh, also very interesting that we address as a new groups. And finally, it fosters strongly needed self-directed learning competences learning that competences uh, will be necessary will for be in necessary a society of tomorrow. Society so, of tomorrow. thank you again uh, for, you and again. I love uh, to hear your questions. I love to hear your questions. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, and, uh, and we're going to change the format a little bit and take questions now. So, is are there any, any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, Professor Ebner, is there a university policy uh, that supports you while providing your MOOC? Are you getting any reduction in teaching load or any help in that line? Also at my university currently not because also we are we are running the first uh, MOOC at the university next summer semester. It will be my own lecture. Uh, in the other mm, University of Graz, um, this is an uh, online lecture. Other uh, this uh, um, um, where students can uh, uh, choose there for their own. They have to do that online and have to make the uh, final assessment at the university. And of course there is an, a kind of reduction. But um, we have to be in mind that as you have also to, to make the online moderation or something like that, and you have to make this producement of the MOOC. And if you summarize all the efforts you have to do before and you have to do uh, during the course, um, I would say um, it will not reduct your load work um, for 10 years. You know, because um, you have to provide um, one year before, um, you have to produce the videos, you have to produce uh, the PDFs, the PowerPoints, and the hyperlinks. And that is really, really uh, much effort um, to make all this stuff. But of course, you can maybe change um, how you teach. And that's um, very interesting because you can say all the stuff I normally um, explained in the lecture room in a very, very traditional way. Um, I can change because um, just students um, leave at home, just hear that. It's just uh, the same as every year and come back to me and we discuss it uh, at the lecture hall, for example, your question or something like that. But um, also that is not changing very dramatically. That means on a university which is very traditional, it's a very long run to uh, also bring this in mind to the teachers and they know if they have to discuss something, they have much more effort. So there are big discussions about that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Then I would have one. Hi, Martin. It's Jule. Um, could you uh, tell us a bit more about this uh, Arbeitsbuch um, that you mentioned? What exactly is included in that from the course? Yeah, just a moment. I have to decide me. So the, 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 this working shoot Arbeits book is just a very small uh, 30 pages um, book, um, not a book, it's a working sheet. And uh, for example, you have um, in this um, week one, uh, you see here, there is week one, it's just um, a warm welcome. And it just provides uh, an additional content to the video. In the video, we are explaining what is this week. For example, you have just eight minutes because the people are just here to us eight minutes. And then you have to read that. And there are, of course, also some exercises where the people can uh, put in their, their ideas and something like that. And after that, if they have read that you know, for week one, they have done the video, then they can do the self-assessment. And we estimate that they have about two hours per week um, which is the workload for the people if they are doing that. And uh, 
our idea was the people to connect um, learning because learning is much more than just looking at videos. Um, also to do some exercise and to provide local learning groups where they have to discuss about what they are learning. And um, that's what's the idea to make some some working sheets in this direction. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Any other questions? Anyone? Are we all happy? <laughs> Martin, thank you so very much for your talk. Um, and uh, yes, we will, will. Are you going to stay around a little longer or are you going to leave us? Sorry, I didn't hear it um, because you're very. <coughs> talking to the wall. <laughs> 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 um, are you going to uh, are you going to stay with us uh, for a little while longer, or are you going to leave us? You can if you want to. Sorry, where where should I go to England or? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your talk. How about that? You can stay if you wish. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, so I have to go to work, of course. And um, warm greets to Elm, I see there. Hi. <laughs> it's a very pity that I'm not kid again. I would love it much more to see you personally. But uh, have a good workshop, of course, and uh, all the best for the day. Yeah. Martin, a little story. Can I tell you? Yeah. I will tell it in German. Yes. Do I interest you in L3T workshop at Reichenhall? Yeah. yeah. Das, groß, das große Banner, was ich mitnehmen ja. durfte, das ja, große ja. Banner, äh, und das war ein ganz toller Workshop dort zu L3T, dieses Banner hat einen ganz tollen Einsatz an diesem Wochenende. Es ist ein Welcome-Gruß für Flüchtlinge, für die ein Fest organisiert wird bei uns in der Region. Es ist von der anderen Seite verwaltet worden und äh, hat es nur auf diese Chance gebracht. <lacht> Danke dir. Gut, dann euch noch einen schönen Workshop, ja? Ciao. Ciao. Tschüss. Tschüss. Gut, ähm, we're going to continue with the next presentation, which is um, by um, Shukra and Zahra. We're going to take care of all the machines right here. Um, as Inga said at the beginning, uh, two PhD candidates here at the cluster who, um, uh, of course, next to their academic careers, have been working with me in the editorial office for quite a long time. And um, they are very much uh, at the front line of, of creating this book because they are pulling um, much of the <coughs> content concept uh, together and translate them into into the this new medium, um, and uh, there's lots of coordination and lots of coding and lots of um, work uh, involved in making that happen. Because I think it's it surprises me just how extraordinary the challenge is to translate an existing course you know very well forwards and backwards and take that thing and put it into a completely different vessel. I did not expect, uh, well, there's a lot of things I didn't expect, but um, I didn't expect that it would be just in terms of conceptualizing this and to, to pull all the different possibilities together. I did not expect it to be quite so challenging. Um, it's exciting, but that is, of course, the flip side of, of courage is always in our editing. And, uh, and I had no idea that we would get ourselves into this kind of into this kind of uh, deep water. So um, uh, Zara and Sita will now introduce um, what the preparation for the book in Heidelberg is actually looking like uh, on the day. First of all, thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, as Andreas just introduced, uh, we would like to share some of our sort of actual experiences and the challenges we face along the way. Of course, our MOOC is um, still in progress, so um, um, what we're going to share with you today is more of, a, of what's going on at the moment, behind the scenes and so on, which is maybe part of the inspiration for the name of this workshop. Um, which we are, and, and this is going to be the first sort of MOOC that we think will be finalized from Heidelberg University. Um, so 
with such a multifaceted assignment, time and project management um, is bound to pose a challenge, and I'm sure it's a challenge that we've all had to face. Um, in our case, um, the funding we received uh, comes with a six-month time limit. Having begun in July, our brief is to develop and produce this MOOC by December. And that's six months to conceptualize, develop, and create the first MOOC to be offered by Heidelberg University. Um, we envision that as the new year begins, uh, we will still be developing and finalizing the MOOC, but it has been our mission to ensure that as much of the MOOC is developed as possible before our funding period ends. And in line with one of the main messages that we actually convey in our, um, in our academic writing courses that we teach here at the university, um, we are drafting and continuously redrafting the course content as we learn more about the potential of MOOCs in terms of global education. We find ourselves repeatedly asking how we translate what we have been working on in the classroom to an online platform that is accessible to potentially tens of thousands of participants worldwide. Effective teaching and learning methods employed for online courses differ substantially, of course, from the methods used in the classroom. The issue of pedagogy has been one of the main challenges in this regard. Especially within a university setting, we are accustomed to particular teaching methods that involve face-to-face -face, um, interactions within a lecture hall or in a seminar room. When we expand this so-called classroom uh, to a virtual one and an open one, we are faced with issues of diversity in terms of language, culture, teaching and learning methods. And consequently, content development for this MOOC has required much planning and brainstorming and a lot of rethinking in terms of the material we have already accumulated in the courses that we teach here at the university. On to content development. <laughs> also, um, thank you very much for being here. I will give you a short walk through um, to the content development of our course. Content development of an online course is no mean feat, since the end users of the course are not easily determined and identified. While designing the MOOC course and academic essay writing in English, our main objective is to keep it simple, precise, and interesting, so as to cater to a diverse range of learners. For this, an engaging, precise, and succinct content is our final goal. A proper balance of audio, visual, and written material is what we have set to attain in the course so that none of the medium becomes overwhelming, boring, and or intimidating. Prepare <laughs> preparing a writing course on academic writing in English from a non-English speaking country is an exciting challenge as well. Our MOOC team is a hearty mix of native as well as non-native English speakers. And here in Heidelberg, the huge international student community gave us the perfect ambience and enthusiasm for our project. The main inspiration for this course, however, came from our first-hand experience of teaching masters, doctoral, and postdoctoral students. Two of our team members, my colleague Zara, and Dr. Hacker are involved in teaching academic English to students at different levels of their university career, and needless to say, the full houses also prompted us to extend our services to the global community. <laughs> Andrea is hiding her face because this is her, this is the blueprint of, of the first module. This is the blueprint of our structure module. This module spreads itself over a week, where we cover issues in the way of finding a topic, developing a hypothesis, to finally framing a well-rounded research statement. With such mind-boggling charts, as you can see, for each week, we start off from the top, working our way into the details of each week's course structure. We have a six weeks course, structure which aims at guiding students right from hunting their sources to the end result, <coughs> writing a structured essay. The course also contains animations, audio podcasts, interviews and exercises, balancing and clarifying each nuance of academic writing. 
We consulted some of these classics of academic writing. We have developed their approach further, particularly for the exercises. Some exercises in our course are taken from sources with a CCBY license, openness being the most important aspect of our course. The exercises are framed with examples from different disciplines so as to keep them appealing and relatable to students from diverse academic backgrounds. Also, since this is a course in academic writing where students need to actually sit down and write, the exercises are not exclusively multiple choice, but at times require students to frame, rephrase, correct, and sum up their ideas in their own sentences. Previously, I talked about keeping a balance between audio and video content in our course so as to not to make one medium riding over another and to keep the interest intact. We also decided to significantly balance video lectures because at times they are not engaging enough and people tend to get distracted. <laughs> Philip Guo and colleagues found that students generally stopped watching MOOC videos that, th that were longer than six to nine minutes. Further, the median time they spent watching a tw 12 to 15 minute video is about 4.4 minutes. This thought constantly guides us while preparing our course. However, we do have intro and outro videos establishing the premises of our course every week summing up the previous weeks and providing a teaser trailer into the next week's content. To balance our linear platform, Open edX, we have also made use of animations through Prezi and Powtoons to keep the course interestingly interactive and non-linear. Instead of video lectures, we will feature interviews with professors from different disciplines to talk about the ingredients of a good and successful essay. Their opinions and ideas are spread across the course in the form of audiovisual interviews, which will give our students an opportunity to hear from the experts and relate to their varied disciplines. However, each interview is kept short so as not to overload our listeners. Designing the MOOC to us has been like a sweet challenge. You have already heard about the time pressure from my colleague earlier. Catering to a global audience with something as malleable and diversified as the English language is also a big challenge. English being the official language in 79 countries, with each territory having their own personalized accents and styles of speaking and writing, it is no mean feat to lay down rules to a uniform structure and ideas of writing. However, our main aim is to encourage the global student community to sit down and write a proper, well-structured essay. We wish to encourage them to read and to read ethically, acknowledging their sources and finally come up with an original piece of writing of their own. Thank you. We're not finished, though. <laughs> I am done. <laughs> So, on to the technicalities. <laughs> Since we've started to develop this interactive content that we hope will engage students in a strong learning experience, we've had to simultaneously translate it into the edX platform, or at least be certain from the start that what we wish to achieve with the platform can actually technically be implemented. While in some aspects the edX platform is simple to use, it can also get extremely complex. Fortunately, within our team, we can bring together our respective experiences, which are quite diverse. Between us, we have enough knowledge of HTML, CSS, and Python to just about construct an interactive exercises that are either autograded or peer-assessed. In terms of autograding, we've started with simple exercises, such as multiple choice questions and checkboxes, and these are particularly useful for testing students on aspects of grammar, but also for testing students on identified, identifying correct and incorrect cases of paraphrasing, quotation, and topic sentences. We're also making um, use of text inputs, where students can be asked to write one-word answers or even whole sentences, which is an effective way to test students on grammar, but also on the finer points of writing sentences. 
But in order for this sort of exercise to be auto-graded, we need to ensure that our coding includes all the possible answers that a student could write to answer correctly. We therefore need to consider all the possible combinations of words or phrases or punctuation that would mean that the student would have answered this particular question correctly, which can be quite tedious. For this to work, we need to think like students, and to think like students from different disciplinary, cultural, social, age and educational backgrounds, because these are all aspects that will affect students' answers, and because this is not a scientific or mathematical equation, there is usually more than one correct answer. We are also making use of more complex and perhaps more challenging exercises such as drag and drop tasks, which include visuals that need to be dragged into the correct order or into the correct space or context, enabling students to order and categorize items and to understand academic write writing using a more visual approach. Behind the scenes, the coding for this kind of exercise looks like this. And this is what we've been working for hours and hours in our editorial office. And with such exercises, we must work with this coding rather than with a simpler visual interface. And with all of these exercises, it is possible to provide hints so that students can request a hint if they feel that they are stuck. And, and this might prompt them to think about the question from a different angle. As we are dealing with a largely text-based subject, we are also planning to make great use of the annotation tool which enables instructors um, and students to annotate text and highlight them and provide comments, which reflects many aspects of the track changes mode in Microsoft Word. And this can enable students to think critically about large texts or smaller excerpts of texts. Working with open access articles, we are able to then allow students to read and critically analyze published material, providing a connection between this course and the external academic world. These exercises would not be auto-graded, but we do intend to make great use of the discussion forums of edX and also social networks such as Twitter, which will enable students and instru instructors to communicate on a deeper level about the challenges of reading, understanding and writing texts. We will also be making great use of prose writing exercises. Of course, this is about essay writing. And these will be peer assessed, enabling students to gain another insight into academic writing from the side of the reader or the reviewer. Peer assessment and online collaborative learning have been shown to be effective methods of learning by authors such as Keith Topping and Janet MacDonald. Peer assessment has also been central in the academic writing courses that we teach here at the Cluster and the Graduate Academy of the University of Heidelberg. Transferred to the edX platform, the peer assessment uh, exercises require students to first input their own prose answers to questions at an interface that looks like this. And then they are provided with a, an assessment rubric, which they can use as a guide to assess their peers' work through a multiple choice interface. Learning how to use the edX platform, how it works, has been a challenge in itself, as we need to understand the limitations of what we are able to achieve through a particular platform provided from a particular provider. The coding alone has sometimes proven to be quite testing because edX uses its own version of HTML and Python, which is not always conventional nor consistent across the entire platform. However, we have learned a substantial amount about this platform, and we are particularly excited about its features that transfer learning from what seemed like linear content during the development phase to engaging interactive and non-linear -mater non material online. Learning about features like the word cloud, which enables students to input their own ideas and see it appear visually, along with all the other students' ideas, is just one example of this. Another is the capabilities offered by the, the platform's forums. And it is through such exercises, we believe, that students can achieve a more fulfilled learning experience, where they are able to work with their peers, regardless of the size of the course and its global nature. Thank you. My question, I first want to say that um, how much we are proud in the cluster and the directorate of the cluster that the cluster is at the front line of developing such things, such tools for the university. And uh, therefore, we are very grateful to Andrea Hacker for what she has achieved. And uh, one has to bear in mind that Andrea is a very busy person. She's the head of the publication department of the cluster and that she was willing to embark 
on this challenge of writing up the application, being willing to, to do this, to conceive the whole MOOC project and to be successful in that, which could be a mixed blessing, uh, but it isn't, as it, as it becomes clear now. All this is her work and the work of her team, Jule, Sara, and the other, and the other um, co collaborators. So first of all, a big, big thank you for all of this. It's really a pity that this is so pressed into a very short time. And this brings me to the question. Um, I think one of the, what comes up to, in my mind is you have quite significant funds for a very short time to develop this particular MOOC. But how will this be further developed in the university? Because these funds are only limited. And uh, so the danger is that without these funds, such things can easily become a dog and pony show, not very professionally made. So how will the rectorate of the university ensure that um, the, the budget will be there and will not be cut away from other tasks? So how will they persuade the uh, Ministry of Research that this is something important? That's a question, um, <laughs> which I, um, you know, I, I don't even dare to think about. But it, it, of course, it bears question. I mean, there are people who are interested in, in producing books who have exactly and precisely that question mm -hmm. to to ask. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do as we're producing um, these blueprint exercises, for example, these are things we're trying to put together and make available to other courses that come after us. We are basically using much of the funding, and it is rather generous funding, um, to, to, we're trying to use the money to, to prepare an infrastructure um, for the entire institution where people then can go and, um, and use the different kinds of exercises that we find and the different kinds of approaches that we find um, to, to produce their own MOOC. Um, and hopefully, we we're working, for example, with the old with the uh, with the, uh, with the uh, com com uh, computing uh, the IT uh, and computing center of the university to uh, uh, um, to see how we can reasonably invest some of these funds into mid to long term instruments and tools that will then be available to uh, to the rest of campus. Um, we have, it is a mixed blessing, this, because on the one hand we have, of course, the, 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 the luxury, and it is luxurious to have um, six people completely devoted to the creation of this one. comes, of course, with a shadow of the time limit, and that is, that it keeps us on it. I don't think that any of us is really bored and has much time to sit around. It is eating us alive, but... Um, but I think, I think we are thinking we're very conscious of, of trying to use the funds and invest them reasonably um, and, and, and usefully into, into those that come after, after this pilot project. Um, as to what the university is able or willing to invest at any other given time for Detlef, I don't think we want to speculate too much on that. I yeah. have no <laughs> idea, to be honest. But I do know, uh, one thing I will say, and I, one thing I do know is that the rectorate is, um, is very interested in moving, in moving this forward. And, and, to, and to, um, that was my impression, and to make this a uh, uh, central, central strategic development of the university. We'll see. We'll see how that goes in a year from now. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Yes. I think that uh, um, the MOOC is a massive open, mm -hmm. and we only f um, focus on the audience uh, mm -hmm. in the world when we yeah, speak about open. Mm -hmm. But we can focus also uh, inside the university mm -hmm. to open the knowledge and the Absolutely. experience yes. uh, you made with mm -hmm. the development of this yes. MOOC. Uh, uh, to share this knowledge with mm -hmm. all your colleagues and um, yes. uh, who are interested, yes. and I think there's uh, a, a lot of knowledge uh, 
you made. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, uh, the um, times when I was responsible for uh, e-learning and uh, the production mm -hmm. of online trainings, and we decided to make them as, as some uh, web-based trainings by ourselves because we wanted to learn and to know um, uh, how will it work and so on. And um, uh, it's like a, a déjà vu, <laughs> this one. <laughs> and um, uh, if we came uh, to, to a point where we didn't uh, know how to make this, we had uh, a partner and he made this for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an agreement uh, because we got the code and we could use this code even uh, each time. Uh, and um, so the knowledge uh, shared uh, to the whole mm. department. Mm. And I think with uh, MOOCs will be mm. the same. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the things that is very interesting in the choice of open edX that there are other headaches in terms of distribution and finding an audience. There is a headache about that. But one of the things that, that, uh, that we find extremely promising is the fact that it's open edX and you can add to the to the to the arsenal if you wish of possibilities uh, within the institution of course but also beyond and I think that is a very nice thing to have if you are partnering with a with a you know with a platform that doesn't have that kind of thing and does these behind the scene for the money that you give them to 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 play then you know it's it's perhaps not quite so open but that is something that perhaps we can talk about later but yes absolutely i mean it is i think it is part of our mission to to document very carefully and to create a catalog of experiences of shortcuts of pitfalls of of, of possibilities and so on and as i said before to invest the money that we have gotten um reasonably in in some production production related uh, uh, possibilities so that people who, who want to do MOOCs and don't have this kind of you know official big push that, that we get can work reasonably with it and avoid the, the what did you call it the, the dog and pony show <laughs> <laughs> yes we, we know what it yes um, yes go ahead yeah um, thank you for showing us your material what I would like to know is is your MOOC tied to the time frame of the semester or can anyone go through at his or her own pace? Yeah. How do you plan on that? Um, but the plan at the moment is, uh, we have no plan. Um, <laughs> the, plan <laughs> the plan at the moment is to keep this rather independent of the semester. It's not necessarily tied to the university uh, timing, right, and, and right. yearly cycle. Uh, <coughs> we we have also taken taken quite a few MOOCs, and one of the things that I think is dangerous is to make MOOCs too long. And and I think I think for this kind of exercise and for the things that we can can that we, that we want to get across, I think a six week uh, time frame is going to be enough. It's going to be tight. I have no idea if we will be able to get everything reasonably in there. We still have to experiment with you know how much you can pack into one week if it's reasonable. Or if we might have to extend to an eight-week time frame, but no, we are we are. It's not necessarily tied to the semester um, time frame. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Also, maybe if I can add, yeah. due to the fact that it won't be a class where students get credits for. So it's an, it's an extra for them, and so it might actually make sense to not have it run at the same time. Right. So they also have the time and the energy to invest, because it won't be two hours per week, I guess, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Martin Ebner described for their moves. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it will take them longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, I mean, there are two ways of participating in the MOOC. You can <coughs> do it while it's live, and you can always clock in later and, and take the material that, 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 that you find. You don't have the benefit of, of, of the live progression of it and the interaction with, with peers and with, with tutors uh, uh, and so on, and then Twitter feeds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but the material will be <coughs> available, and if someone prefers to be a self-paced learner, then... You yeah. Then that's what they do. Mm -hmm.